Mr. Beacon podcast is sponsored by Williot, scaling IoT with battery-free Bluetooth. All right, welcome to the Mr. Beacon podcast. I'm talking to Rene Batsford, who is the CEO and uh, founder, founder, co-founder of, of Checkfa. So welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so, Rene, I've been looking forward to this discussion because you are tackling one of the most difficult areas of uh, where where physical and digital come together, the, the kind of the, the ordering, the payment uh, experience. And um, I every time I go out, which is not super often, but I am so frustrated by how stuck in the dark ages we are. And it seems like you're taking on something that many, many people have failed. And actually, in the Beacon Technologies book, I wrote a book, a, a, a chapter on payments, and I used this image from Afghanistan, which is probably tasteless, but I chose it because this is kind of a place where people have tried to conquer uh, and, uh, and failed repeatedly, but it sort of draws, draws uh, ambitious uh, people in repeatedly. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about... Uh, what 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 you what you're working on there, and then we'll uh, then we'll get into the psychology of uh, of why you decided to sign up for such a difficult task. Okay, uh, so yeah, so um, I formed Check for after um, a leaving. I left uh, McDonald's. I was uh, working for McDonald's as a um, uh, innovation uh, lead, um, and um, I guess uh, again a lot of uh, companies are kind of I suppose born out of frustration in terms of you're trying to kind of um, improve uh, uh, something or uh, ta tackle a particular problem um, and um, yeah in summary that's kind of where Check for came from and Check for really was about look we know there's this growing demographic which um, are glued to their phones like we all are um, how can you simplify and make um, your life easy um, in, from a sort of a hospitality standpoint um, and, and really not just um, um, not just approach it it's in a singular way so from a singular um, uh, user uh, journey but, but multiple different sort of user journeys and what I mean by that is um, I call it the kind of path to purchase so um, a lot of people will attack this kind of uh, uh, kind of service offering uh, individually so, you know, looking at, oh, let's use QR codes or let's use NFC for, um, you know, one user journey and then we'll use something else. And you kind of start to step back from that and you think, well, hang on, how confusing is that going to be for a customer? Because the hardest, one of the hardest things to do is to educate customers. Uh, and if you're having to pour a lot of time and effort into doing that, then it just um, stifles the whole process. So what I really wanted to do is to create a kind of almost, you yeah, know, the ideal kind of panacea for to say, one type of engagement um, and and uh, you know you know the kind of the technology piece kind of takes care of it the whole the whole thing mm -hmm. so um, so so I suppose I'm probably doing it quite badly but what I'm trying to explain is that rather than having loads of different types of technology interfacing with the customer mm -hmm. just have one and it will work across all the different use cases mm -hmm. Um, and the use cases are not being um, from marketing led, uh, the use cases being a utility. And I just felt that, you know, I'd done some, we'd done some trials in the past, not on McDonald's in a previous life, um, using beacons for marketing and push messaging. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, you get to that point where you go, if you're spamming people, mm -hmm. uh, they're just going to switch it off. Yeah. So it needed to be something where how could a beacon technology enable a, a user journey um, and uh, it, you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's kind of really where where kind of check for comes in so check for is really about um, onboarding the customer um, and also um, onboarding the customer and then also basically uh, so, so there's several points so onboarding where you approach a restaurant so typically you people use that for geo geo fencing Geofencing is okay, but there's a degree of kind of um, uh, drift in that. Like, you know, if you're going in a car, you'll find, oh, hang on, I'm going round a roundabout. I've gone off at the wrong, where mm -hmm. beacons can do right down to the kind of centimeters. They can be very precise. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also, in our use case, um, just making it easy to check into a table. 
So a lot of restaurants uh, and hospitality uh, locations obviously have service. Um, and, you know, we've all been there where you get to a restaurant and you've got to wait to be sat down or you've got to wait for your menus. So I kind of, I was actually in a restaurant one day and I kind of sat there and I thought, I'm going to get my stopwatch out. You know, and I've worked in hospitality for like 25 years. So I had a very good idea of what this idea that was emerging from my head would do. But actually, I just wanted to just sit there and just analyze them. For a whole day, I was in kind of a restaurant and I actually went to other restaurants and I was just measuring the time it took and all the interactions between service, so staff and customers. And thought to myself, do you know what, this, this, you could actually reduce the uh, uh, time it's taking for a customer to get service. So from the point of entry, from the point of getting seated, from the point of getting a menu, from the point of ordering, from the point of paying, um, and also this whole there's this whole kind of thing around. I think Amazon kind of really attacked it really well, which was, and I use this as an analogy where like Amazon Prime, right? So if you order something on Amazon Prime and then later on in the day you think, oh, I wish I'd ordered that other thing as well. You don't bother because you go, you know, you're going to order, you know, you're going to order, uh, 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 you know, something. And then uh, you think, well, I'm just going to order again. So it immediately pops into my head. And that analogy I've used for things like, so if you're in a restaurant, for instance, typically you're going with a notion of going, well, I'm, not, I'm, you know, I'm probably going to have a starter, I'm probably going to have a main. I'm not quite sure about this, uh, if I've got the space, right? So for me, it was like, well, what's the problem in ordering and paying? Mm -hmm. Why do you need a tab? Mm -hmm. And immediately it was like, bingo, you know, actually order, pay, which is um, that, the, the new check for brand that we're launching. Mm -hmm. um, that is, is kind of where it's at, really. So rather than kind of doing the payment piece at the end, if you onboard the customer in the right way, check them into, they can do effectively self-checking or auto-check into a table, mm -hmm. then actually ordering and paying up front makes complete sense because you're done, right? So you go, actually, no, I don't want a dessert. I'm just going to leave now. Mm -hmm. You can just leave. Because you know the, the restaurant knows you've ordered and you know you've paid, job done, mm -hmm. and it just kind of just collapses that whole elongated process. And again, if you go into a traditional restaurant which doesn't have our technology, you'll see that it's like, you know, like I said, I, I go to the restaurant, I get, I, I ask, I wait to be seated, I'm seated. I, I, they then bring the menus over, and they then come back and ask me, do I want anything to drink? They then come back and say, what do I want to order? Do I want mains? You know, it's just, I mean, this is this is cost and this is time. And particularly if you're someone who's the customer is time poor, you know, I, you, may want, you, might, you might want to go off to see a movie or you need to be somewhere. And it just makes the whole kind of process far more efficient, in my view. And it's not about removing, because uh, a lot of the time, a lot of people say, oh, is it going to mean that we, you're going to lose service staff? No, because not everyone's going to use this process. But the more people who use it, it means that the more efficient the restaurant is or the quick service restaurant, I'll give you some other use cases, the more efficient it becomes. And then that means you can put staff elsewhere. So you can put more staff in the kitchen. So what it means is that the whole process is more efficient. You know, the, the turnover of the cover of the tables is more efficient. And, and ergo, you know, getting orders to the kitchen is more efficient because it's just going straight from your phone straight to the kitchen. So anyway, so that was a bit of a long... <laughs> no, it was great. I mean, you were interviewing yourself. I uh, my work is done. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. You very much. No, no, I, I, there's some more questions to ask. But just to kind of recap. So what you're doing is you're enabling a mobile app that will streamline and feel free to stop me and contradict yeah. so that will streamline the uh, the order experience the payment experience so there's basically less waiting around I, it's just so frustrating and I actually quite often I go into a restaurant and the, and the service will be really good at some point maybe you get seated fast or they do a great job of the order or they'll allow you to pay quickly but it's so rare for them to do all three of those things yeah. Very well. And, and, and you're like, as you say, you've got to go to a movie, you've got to get back to work. It's like, yeah. and, and you end up going from being delighted to just fuming. And, and yeah. the ironic thing is, this is costing everyone money. It's costing, it's costing the server tips because you're like, really frustrated. It's yeah. costing the restaurant table turns, they're not getting people in and out. So 
Um, so, that, as you said, more importantly, is costing the customer. Uh, again, that makes it's, it's, it can be frustrating. And, and like, as you say, particularly in hospitality with the churn, it, you know, uh, efficiency is important, uh, but also consistency. So, um, and also the other thing as well is if you are a regular customer to that brand um, and you know what you like, you're going through that. It's almost like um, you it's like um, Groundhog Day. You're going through the same process again and again and again every single time because you're saying this is what I like. This is what I like. Well, actually, um, you know, the the application knows what you like because you're the one who programs it. Yeah. Um, and actually, you can then use that data to uh, more effectively upsell, um, and you can also use the data to uh, 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 provide recommendations as well. Um, and one of the things we're working on is things like allergens. That's quite a big thing. So making sure that you can just filter your allergens so you, you, you don't have to worry about that. Yes. Um, so all of these things, you know, so I'm literally going in, checking in automatically to the table, transmitting my order straight to the kitchen, and the server just needs to bring the order to me. So that, that whole model just, um, as you said, it just you benefit overall. Everyone benefits from that model. So, so the approach we've, we've took is, you know, that the components are the beacon technology, the ability to deploy beacons, uh, um, you know, beneath tables. That's what we're doing. Uh, again, there's also opportunities to look at it. Could we put it into other areas? Um, mm -hmm. and we're also looking at um, not just table service. So I alluded to that earlier. So it could be drive-through, right? So now you're in your car and your phone's just fired your order straight to the drive-through kiosk. You haven't even wound down your window. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's uh, order ahead as well, um, and um, and also sort of like um, sort of pick and pay. So it might be in a kind of a quick service place where you've actually got some product, maybe on a uh, in a langer in a fridge, and and there's there's you know it might be a brewed drink somewhere else. So basically, um, you could then add those orders to your cart. It's a bit kind of like, you know, Amazon have done this, uh, Amazon Go, not Amazon Go, I can't remember, but it's like a shopping experience. Uh -huh. but, but again, you could just do that as well. So, you know, we integrate directly with the um, the POS system. So again, it's almost like a, a, queueless, a, um, a queueless experience, you know, just add the, or, or add the orders, add the products to your basket, pay whilst you're stood there and go. Um, so, so, and that's all can all be kind of very well managed through the pres by using the fact that our beacons are registered with our SDK. Our SDK, if you are a brand, can be deployed within your application, um, and uh, that's what we've done basically. It's really about how how can we nail that user experience for brands who have struggled to do that. Um, so, wh why would they? pour loads of money into that when there's potentially people like us bringing this sort of product set to the market. And so how far have you got with uh, with doing this uh, noble work? So so we're, we're here, we're, we're kind of live. <laughs> um, so it's been... Because uh, you're in a restaurant at the moment, I'm talking to you from... Yeah, uh, we're in our pilot flagship restaurant in Fulham Road in London, very famous uh, part of London, um, and uh, we're launching here. Um, so... Um, and yes, yeah, so the whole restaurant's all beaconized, so all the tables are smart tables now, um, and which takes not not much time at all with our platform. So mm -hmm. you can be up and running within less than half an hour. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have to do the integration in with the point of sale, so it fires the order straight through to the kitchen. Um, but basically, we can do um, we can kind of do a hard integration straight into the pods, or we can also do we can just fire it to a kitchen printer, which is on a cloud network. Uh -huh. as well so there's loads of different kind of ways to tackle it and approach it but yeah our our our, our platform just allows um the the the, the actual um uh, application your so you might have a container um, and that allows that to um uh, be branded and take your products so it's a really nice design as well i'm, I'm quite into my ux and ui uh -huh. so i think that's it's a bit like apple it's kind of you need to bring the two things together to make them work. So I'm quite into that. So I've kind of personally led a lot of that as well. Uh -huh. um, and this is just the start where we see um, the beacon network or kind of closed network. And it's not reliant on um, third party networks either as well, um, other than your typical kind of, 
you know, mobile signal or, or Wi-Fi to yeah. obviously transmit the order and the payment. But other than that, we, we're, we're quite independent. So that creates quite a robust and scalable and cost-effective solution. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not in it to make money from necessarily our beacon technology. Um, we're obviously providing a, a you know, a, a software as a service kind of type solution. Uh-huh. Um, but we can also white label our technology and, and that can be placed into your your branded container or whatever. So yeah, we just, we're an enabler basically. So um, this pilot project on the Fulham Road, can you say what the restaurant is or is it? Yes, it's a wonderful restaurant. So everyone should come here and experience it. So it's boysenberry uh-huh. uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, quite infamous as well in that it's used for a lot of the filming for Made in Chelsea, which is one of these kind of social um, sort of, um, you know, um, sort of um, real life uh, fly on the wall type docu soaps. <laughs> Very good. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So um, you've got that um, uh, deployment there, and can you kind of speak to uh, the 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 the, uh, the pipeline of business that you see? Uh, is uh, is this kind of the first one, and then you're going to wait for the feedback to try to get more customers, or have you got? Yeah, I mean, we obviously I can't say who else we're working with, but we're working with some pretty big global brands at the moment who again I think every single per, every single company that we've shown the technology whether investors or whether they're brands really like the whole idea uh, and each of them like the kind of pick and mix approach so some of them like the the fact that I mean we've even been looking at how we can provide kind of hotspot check-in for things like takeout as well so where you've got third-party um, uh, delivery uh, companies um, of which there are now many around the world, particularly in the UK. So can, can we provide a, 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 a smart way of a customer checking in and and then the, the store knowing or the delivery service checking in effectively and and then the kitchen knowing that they're there as well. So there's there's so there's loads of different use cases. And as I said before, once you've kind of established the kind of beacon type network, um, then uh, you can obviously deliver other services on top of that. So things like auditing and there's so many other kind of, because once that's in as a, a utility, you can then layer services on top of that, if you see what I mean. So what would so auditing what I mean, mean in this context? So, no, so an auditing, so for example, if it was a big campus, let's say, it could be a head office or it could be um, like a, a, I don't know, a, a gym chain. So I don't know, something like David Lloyd in the UK, where they've got a sort of multi-tenanted. So you've got like a restaurants and bars, uh, 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 you know, there's going to be stock rooms. There's going to be, there's going to be lots of different service providers providing service in there, and they might want to uh, have um, obviously area managers visit to audit premises. So it could be health and safety, it could be stock, it could be operations, it could be whatever. By virtue of us having our beacon network in place, it it means that um, we can give precision to certain processes. So for instance, we can place our beacon technology, say in a stock room, uh, and we can say with absolute um, clarity that the the area manager did visit that stock room Mm -hmm. and they did, uh, it therefore then triggered that process where it might be where, um, let's just say, uh, yeah, uh, uh, someone who's auditing is very pushed for time and they do the bare minimum at each site. So what we're saying is, no, actually, it, it works on two levels. One, it, it gives the head office clarity about how long it takes to do that particular part of the audit. Mm-hmm. And also, you could then say, well, actually, you could reprioritize the audit based upon the visit. And so, well, you've actually got only 30 minutes. So, we want you to do one, five, and seven, skip two, and because they're not priority at the moment. So, my mind's already whirring away <laughs> thinking about how our interfaces, our APIs, and technology can make the whole uh, process of auditing more efficient because we can hyper-locate right. that individual and therefore the processes that are attached to that location. It's so you, quite, that's, that's very exciting, actually. So you've got lots of things that you could do with this beacon network, and I love beacon networks. I think it's great you're thinking about that. But, of course, the flip side is you've got to focus, otherwise you kind of won't get anywhere. Yep. Where, where, so, so, so really... So really, it's about sorry, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm jumping the gun there. So really, it's about delivering that, nailing that experience, the one that I've outlined before. Yeah. Getting that in place, um, and uh, yeah, we're doing pretty well at the moment in terms of attracting the right 
brands and customers. Um, and again, e- e- each one of them wants to try out a different part of the solution. Mm-hmm. Um, and because we're under NDA, I can't say who. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but each, no, they're, they're, they're very, I mean, we've talked under NDA. And so I can, yeah. uh, the reason so why I mean, we're it, having this conversation it, is that I'm very impressed by the traction that you're getting with some really large uh, global brands. But um, one question I had is, it sounds like there's going to be two approaches. One is your uh, your SDK, your libraries will be in the app for a major brand that already has a mobile app that uh, yep. their customers are using. But they'll also be, is it order pay, an order pay app that you can use? <clears throat> yeah, so um, I don't want to go too much into it. But yeah, we want to kind of be able to scale um, our offering. Um, so one of the big challenges for any uh, uh, application is scale so um, because again as a customer you're not necessarily going to visit that same restaurant all the time Mm -hmm. unless it's your regular daily where you get your breakfast from or whatever so I think that's where um, we're looking to go well how do we how do we scale this technology to the next level and I think that's probably where what we're looking at is how do you create a channel Mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, you know enabling each individual a brand so um, but we can do both the, the advantage of our technology is we can deliver for both both kind of uh, you know both an individual brand and also a, a large-scale channel and that's what excites uh, you know lots of investors to us as well and how is that going in terms of so you talked about progress with the technology how's how's the company going at what, what kind of size are you at where are you at in terms of funding yeah, I mean, so we've done the kind of sort of first round to get us to where we needed to get to in terms of developing the technology, and we're, we're pretty much there now. Um, and you know, it's a case of um, focusing on the opportunities. Um, you know, um, some major brands which obviously we're engaged with, and doing pilots with those, um, and obviously that will continue this year. Um, and then to obviously enable that to scale. To even bigger opportunities, um, then it's you know looking at um, other sort of um, major sources of funding to grow our team, scale scale our scale our ambition. Yeah, yeah, being able to scale the company in line with our ambitions, I guess. Um, but again, with a lot of these things, you do these things in 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 steps, in fa- in phases. Mm-hmm. You don't want to just go whole hog. You test, learn, test, learn, test, learn, test, learn. That's the that's the best way to do it. So one of the things you mentioned was you, in this case, have integrated with the point of sale system. Isn't yep. that very challenging to do? My my experience is that these guys are like uh, gatekeepers, and uh, yeah. well, a their life is challenging. They've got a million companies that want to integrate with their point of sale system, so they've got limited resources. But b they're they're greedy, as we all are in business. We're trying to figure out how we can make money, and so they're like making uh, demands in terms of uh, payments and so forth how have you approached that and is, so, is this yeah, I mean, uh, go ahead yeah i mean they're, sorry yeah i mean they're protective of their customer base like any customer would be so um you know um and if you're not uh, that then um you're probably not going to be around for that. you know if you go oh, yeah fine have access to everything well there's things like gdpr and you know, data protection, all sorts of things that they have to think about. So, there's, you know, their their job is, you know, I've worked with many, many POS companies, and I know many, many people in the industry, given the sort of background that I'm from. So, I, you know, I sympathise with 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 them, and also they're going through a lot of change. So, there's lots of disruption in the market. Uh, there's lots of these boys, uh, uh, guys who've come up from a tablet kind of um, technology, you know, where they've got a clean slate. They don't have necessarily all of the machinations of a large scale pods company. They don't have all the costs and they can be a lot more agile, whereas a, a lot of these guys are a lot more mature, got a lot more experience, but they're, they're, they're obviously, you know, they're obviously deep um, and, you know, they've, they've put a lot of investment into their product. Um, so I, you know, sympathize with sort of both really. Um, mm-hmm. So I think, um, uh, and also as, as the, the newcomers, um, of this world, um, I'm not naming any names, start to mature as well. Um, with that maturity comes more complexity because, the you know, as they start to uh, become more um, successful, then the the companies that they started out with, the brands, they're starting to scale and they don't want them to leave them. So they have to add more features and value 
to that. So they have to go from a kind of like a, a light to an enterprise. And, and the, the difference between those is, again, what a lot of these large POS companies have had to go through. So, you know, it's just that the form factors that have come into the market, tablets and things like that, and even handsets as well, um, are, are continually evolving. So it's, it's, it's a very challenging space. So to get to the point that you've made, uh, there's a new breed of um, uh, companies out there which basically un unlock the ability to be able to access these POS companies' um, uh, estates, um, which are you know, third-party API uh, platforms. Um, and there's quite there's a few out there, um, and they're growing really successfully. And again, it's allowing now the the POS. Um, and the uh, you know you've got the pause almost like you say in the middle <laughs> as it, of innovate it's almost kind of almost seen as it's getting in the way of innovation yeah so if you're if you're a brand you're an operator you're like I want to be able to do these I want to be able to create these experiences for my customers um, you know and I'm so frustrated because I can't because there's this you know there's this uh, roadmap and it's not until two years and if we continue like this we're going to lose customers to our competition all that so what's what's happened and this is happened with things like open banking as well so again when you've got these very kind of uh, you know robust brands of banks and, and all this sort of stuff and they want to innovate as well you know because they're losing customers to new startup so it's the same thing so this is where again this revolution around open apis um, and uh, and things like that rest apis and all that kind of stuff that's really what's unlocking the potential of getting at these um customers these brands uh, and being out you know from where I'm coming from, I'm all about innovation. I want to be able to make the whole user experience more um, successful and more clean and more tight and more slick and all these things, which is basically what the customers, the, the ultimate customers want. Um, so, so that's kind of where that's really where these 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 new breed of companies have, do, have done. They've done a lot of the hard work where they're integrating with the POS companies, and then you basically are linking in with them. So it means that you need to, you only need to like a company like us, you only need to do one integration, and they'll just pivot uh, again. You know, against all the other POS providers. So effectively, it means that it means that you know it just makes it a lot easier for you to um, it makes it a lot easier for you to uh, do you to go about being innovative, basically. And so, can you drop some names of the companies that are doing that? Yeah, I mean, there's um, I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll talk about this one that we kind of work with, like Omnivore. Um, again, so they're they're kind of rapidly growing. Uh -huh. um, so they're they're a, they're a good example of a of a, of a uh, I think they're kind of. Uh, been a bit embarrassed. I don't know if they're stateside or if there's Australia. I can't remember where their genesis is from, but I know they're doing a lot of work over in the states. So, yeah, um, which is obviously where like a large, you know, if you're going to go, if you're going to scale, then uh, you know, in an English language, and it's the states where you're going to kind of uh, that's where you're going to kind of make your money initially. So, well, that's, yeah, that's yeah, a great yeah, dynamic. Yeah. I think I, I'm hopefully that will spur more innovation and it'll make it, it easier for you as well. Uh, so so uh, it would be great to hear a bit about your role in McDonald's and a bit about what you did there. And then I'd be interested to hear how the lessons that you learned uh, from there impacted what you're, you're, you're doing at Checkfer. So what was your role yeah, at mean, McDonald's? It, yeah, so I was um, head of innovation, well, innovation manager, whatever label you want to give me. Uh, my role was really to kind of not purposely be disruptive, but kind of look at um, a lot of projects that were going on at the time. So mobile ordering, mobile payment. Uh, um, I looked at things like wireless charging in tables, um, gaming. I love gaming as well. Um, I don't mean retail. I don't mean yeah. gambling. I mean games for you know, kids and things like that. I love that. And what I try to do is I try to. I suppose it's my my raison d'être is to kind of put joy within an application or joy within a game or whatever it is mm -hmm. that I'm doing so or a platform or whatever to so make it really happy uh, experience basically because I think if it's if it's not then um, basically you're going to get um, quite um, well you're just, just not going to get anywhere with that particular experience um, so so really um, yeah it was, a, it was a kind of a dream job I was there for only about three years but within that, that time I was able to implement VR technology worked on AR, augmented reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, wireless charging, um, uh, which is now obviously in most phones now. Um, 
and uh, kiosk, uh, uh, you know, the kiosks that are everywhere in McDonald's. I helped work on that. Uh, you know, did my bit where I could, where, where I was able to. Um, and, uh, you know, mobile ordering and payment, worked with the, it was a European division and then there was a um, uh, US division that was kind of working on it and I was part of the European team and then ultimately we got sort of made up into the uh, US or the global team as it were. Um, yeah, and yeah did, I mean McDonald's is just amazing. I, 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 uh, a bit like uh, the army, you know, you do your time, in, uh, not you, I'm thinking more about me oh. as a kid. Uh, uh, one of my first jobs, uh, and the, 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 they take these raw recruits, unskilled, undisciplined, spotty kids, and they end up delivering this quality, repeatable, consistent uh, service from uh, from uh, from that. And it's because they've got amazing systems. They have been a incredible innovator and um, point of sale technology. I mean, they really led the led the the, the charge in terms of. Uh, um, the point of sale, having a unified platform deployed Absolutely. and uh, um, yeah. just amazing, uh, light years ahead yeah. of, uh, of many people. And I see what they're doing with, uh, I mean, they obviously have Bluetooth beacons. They, I think it's, uh, they're using radius networks in uh, yep. um, the, the table no, tents works. and everything. <laughs> Sorry? It's another project. It's, I know it very well. It's another project that I touched on and worked on. Yeah. Um, so within my capacity in the UK. So, but the one thing they do teach you um, is about scale. Um, so it's it's about moving at the right pace, um, making sure you're absolutely now the proposition, making sure you've got a robust, scalable uh, solution. Um, and but once you've got that, then being able to scale it. Um, and so they're the things that I think about. Um, obviously, security and there's loads of other things as well. But, but yeah, the, the way they approach and assess and analyze, they, they all do multiple different kind of projects and test different approaches all around the world. And then it's, you know, it's almost like an evolutionary process, the one that, um, you know, and the data that they produce, they've just bought a big data company because um, they've just got masses of data. So being able to analyze that uh, and make sense of that. Uh, and, and what I call actionable data, actually turn it into something rather than just analyze it, is something that they're moving further ahead with now. So yeah, they are, they are very innovative. I would probably um, uh, compare them with something like Apple in the sense that they may not necessarily break the first ground on something. Uh, they'll assess it and analyze it uh, and make sure. I mean, they, they um, are, you know, I was one of the first to launch a contactless payment in the UK when I was head of ITE and I do remember whenever we'd go to these conferences they were always sort of picking my brains and asking me about how it was going because uh, they obviously knew that, that there's something that they wanted to go into but they wasn't too sure at the time so again some of the time it's some some of the time it's, it's good to kind of sit back and see what uh, the competition are doing again a la Apple right so yeah. Apple aren't necessarily the most innovative company but what, what they do is they get that uh, customer proposition right and they absolutely nail it so that's what I, that's why I kind of compared it to in that respect very good well Rene I feel like we could talk for a lot longer but this let's quit whilst we're ahead this is uh, very good good luck with uh, your uh, first uh, deployment there I know there's going to be many others following it and uh, what you're doing is super hard but I think the results will be uh, uh, will be excellent and um, I wish you a lot of success Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk today to you. What would the three songs be that you would uh, take on a trip to Mars? It's, it's probably going to be something by uh, Smashing Pumpkins. And actually, in fact, they did a song, didn't they? Um, what's the, uh, the one from Melancholy and Infinite Sadness? Believe, isn't it, or something like that? Where is they actually go onto the moon? Is that a French, amazing French director from way back when? And he did all the um, kind of animated puppet things. <laughs> I can't remember it. All right. uh, but yeah, it'll be something from Smashing Pumpkins. Okay. Um, probably uh, following the same vein, something from the Foo Fighters as well. Okay. And then something by Queen. All right. So, uh, yeah, probably um, uh, uh, what's the. Um, What's the? I'm, I'm rubbish with the names. Just, <laughs> yeah. Is there? A, well, let's 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 kind of take it back to a moment. Is there kind of a, 
a time in your life or uh, a moment that these songs evoke? Yeah, um, I, I used to go to, well, still try to go to a lot of music festivals. All right. Um, and uh, so in England, we have like, uh, there's like the V Festival and things like that. And actually, in fact, a few years later, I then started to work in the entertainment uh, business as well. So I headed up um, the O2 for, for Anchets Entertainment Group. So they are probably the world's, one of the world's largest um, uh, uh, venue um, uh, um management companies and also um they're a big ticket company now you have ticket master and there's a uh, aeg mm -hmm. axs or something like that um so yeah so it's, it's a bit weird because i ended up kind of working for in a kind of uh, industry which i sort of loved as a consumer yeah um and they do things like coachella and stuff like that so yeah, oh, yeah we just had that Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's yeah, huge. I've never been actually, but I'd love to go one day. But I, I managed to get um, a bit of a flavour for how um, these uh, amazing stadiums run all these events. And I was in the Staples Centre in um, downtown LA. And um, quite famously, that was uh, something of Philip Anschert. So downtown LA and, and all of that was, wasn't a great place to go back in the day. And Philip um, Anschutz, the enterprising person that he was, he'd bought, I think, a lot of the railways in America. Oh. And he'd then uh, sold the railways and kept the real estate either side of it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and used it for a company he created called QWest. So he ran fiber down it. It's just mind blowing that obviously the guy and his, his team uh, is very entrepreneurial, very enterprising. And then he also used that to then develop um, the Staples Center. Uh -huh. So, so obviously where the station comes in, and um, and and the actual blueprints for the Staples Center are the same for O2 Arena, because oh. I was involved in that. So they're exactly the same. It's really? just that the O2 Arena is underneath the O2 tent. So, ah. yeah, so that's, uh, that's quite interesting. So yeah, so so music has always played a big part of my life um, growing up. Um, yeah, again. Uh, I, most recently i'm getting into a lot of classical music as well huh. um so uh so yeah uh, uh satin it's a bit that's a bit melancholy i guess uh -huh. uh, and and people like that so yeah i love i love classical music love all genres really and, and so you were working in that business what were you doing so i was um uh i got a call one day and i was sort of headhunted uh it just happened to, that i was working on a retail system uh and did, doing many other things for a company called um, Molten Brand Cosmetics. So I was global head of IT for them. Um, and then I got called uh, via um, Anschutz Entertainment Group or a, a headhunter. And they asked, would you be interested in this kind of role? It's it's a, quite a, a special project. Um, and I recently visited the Millennium Dome. Uh, it was an interesting, <laughs> I, I guess, um, a cacophony of different ideas. Um, uh, but what was left was this amazing kind of structure um, and under which obviously um, AEG had uh, managed to secure the, the rights to build the uh, arena and I was part of that team so I was part of the team that kind of helped plan out the actual build out of it um, and uh, it was uh, quite a grueling uh, few months, uh, it was about 18 months that I did it for um, and then, uh, yeah, I had to, uh, so I, let, I didn't want to continue it to, to manage it. <laughs> I'd had enough of, uh, of that, but, um, but it was, it was, it was mind blowing. It's, it's a sort of project you can't turn down really. So you saw uh, some, you've just seen some good concerts at the O2 then it sounds like. Oh yeah. I'd been as a, so I, I kind of left before it actually opened. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, so kind of on the run up to it, and we helped deliver that. Uh, but yeah, I've been to the O2. It's amazing. It's probably I think it's the most successful uh, concert arena in the world in terms of uh, sales uh, volumes. I think, as I understand it, it's obviously got good infrastructure there as well. And uh, but yeah, I, I still love the festival. I still love to go kind of like camping uh, for what it's worth. Uh, yeah. So I've been to some amazing ones like Oxygen over in Ireland, which is was crazy because uh, it rains a lot over there and uh, uh, yeah you end up like, mud wrestling <laughs> like that. Um, so, that seems to uh, be a tradition with these concerts doesn't it well very good yeah. well thanks very much for that uh, uh, insight into your, uh, your your affection for music very good yes